Hello everyone and welcome to the final installment in this summer's genealogy series. Today we're going to focus on the different ways to share everything that you learn as you complete your research. Let's go over the agenda. Once again, we're going to start with an extremely brief recap of what we covered before, and then we'll discuss different topics related to sharing what you've learned. First we'll talk about written records and stories, and then we'll talk about oral histories and ways to preserve those. And I'll tell you up front that this video is basically about how to start a family history blog. The goal is to equip you with the tools that you need to preserve and share your research, because even if the people in your family aren't interested now, they probably will be someday. I'm going to start off with just a quick recap of everything we've covered so far to keep it fresh in your mind. You can always go back to those videos or drop me a message anytime you want to talk about how the library can help you with your research. To start, we talked about what genealogy is and how you can get started with it. The most important thing is to start with you, your own knowledge. Write down everything you know about your family, organize all the documents that you have like birth and marriage records, old family records like family Bibles, and old photos that you have. Then you can talk to your oldest living relatives and learn what they know. After that, you can use tools like Ancestry Library and the information that we have in our archive and the Rhode Island Collection to help you fill in the gaps. There's a lot of information out there and it's important to get organized. For a tutorial on Ancestry Library, check out the first video in this series. Organization is what we focused on in part two. I went over the different forms that genealogy researchers use to organize their information and templates that are available on Ancestry Library and other websites. The most important ones are pedigree charts, which show a person with all their ancestors on a tree, and family group records, which show all the details of a set of parents and their kids. That talk also has a lot of links and resources you can use to help with your research. Today, the main thing I want to talk about is writing. If you followed this series, you know now that I have separated it into three parts, learning, preserving, and sharing. You'll also know that a lot of times the line between those three activities is a little blurry because they're all just different aspects of one big thing that we call genealogy research. So today, when I talk about writing, I want to discuss two things. Your notes, which preserve the info, but also writing for others, which will help you share it. Whether you're keeping the info that you find on paper or in digital files, it's valuable. It's the result of hours of work that you've put turning chaotic scraps of information into an organized framework. On the flip side, you also went through that process of learning how to do all of this. Understanding how forms work, what the documents are like, and how strange and arcane it can all seem sometimes. It's easy when you know what you're looking at to understand your notes, because the experience has made you an expert, but it makes them very difficult for other people to process. Spending enough time connecting the little threads from deep in the past is enough to make anyone a little bit loopy. But joking aside, think about it this way. We all learned how to do math in school, and regardless of how good or bad you were at it, by the time you finished high school, you were doing some pretty complex things. You knew about algebra and geometry and the order of operations and all kinds of stuff that you probably have forgotten by now. But before that, you had to learn basic arithmetic. That was the building block to make you understand everything you went on to learn. One reason that people get confused or overwhelmed by genealogy is that they don't have those building blocks. So to get involved, you have to have enough interest in it to push yourself through that early phase and learn the basics and the ins and outs of digging up the info that you need. So if you want your family to be interested in what you've learned, you have to help them with those basics. And even more importantly, you have to find a way to hook them the way that you got hooked into the story. If you've been doing this research for any amount of time, you almost certainly have an organizational system that works for you, and it probably builds off of tools like pedigree charts and family group sheets and the way things have been organized in the tools that you used. So now it's time to organize like a librarian. Take your complex system 
and find a way to make it so that anyone can pick up a file and figure it out with just a little bit of attention. Paper or digital, use clear file names, include an index or a table of contents or a readme file that explains your system for naming things. Develop a system for highlighting things or linking them together. Remember that having extra copies and repeating information is a good idea. Things get lost, so if you have the info stored in multiple ways, you won't lose everything if you lose one thing. Another thing you can build right into your system is a way to bring the coolest stuff you've learned to the forefront. I am a simple person, so amid files I might just have with one called cool stuff and have extra copies of notes on anything really exciting to me. In print files, you might want to make copies of some stuff on bright paper that stands out and says, hey, look, I'm important, all by itself. So now let's talk about how to get those genealogy hooks in. I'm going to start with the big bad news that this might not be possible. Genealogy isn't for everyone. A lot of people don't care about family history, either because they don't see why it's relevant or they've only had bad experiences with the concept. There's definitely an air of pretension that surrounds genealogy, like, oh, it's a bunch of old white people trying to prove that they're related to the king, right? So we may have found a reason that it hooks us, but that doesn't mean that everyone will be interested. That's why you're organized. If they suddenly get interested after you're gone, they can use your excellent files. But the way to get people hooked while you're still around is to make it a good story. You want to share stories, not data. So focus on the things that you can build a narrative about. You want to include old family stories that don't necessarily have evidence, like the time Uncle Joe won the spelling bee, or Grandma Jenkins spit a watermelon seed straight across the yard and next year a plant grew there. Best watermelons Grandpa ever had, I tell you what. And tell your own story. It seems irrelevant now, but 20 or 50 or 75 years from now, when you aren't here living it anymore, those stories will be a connection to your ancestors from their past. Now, where do I suggest you do this? On a blog, of course. Okay, I know that may sound silly, but hear me out. One reason to consider a blog, or some electronic storage method anyway, is the fallibility of paper. I work for a library, and our archive has a lot of paper in it. We have scrapbooks and documents and old maps, and, you know, mostly it's kind of falling apart. Before it made its way to our archive, it was just rapidly deteriorating. And now it's fragile and yellowed and hard to read, and the conditions in our archive have slowed that down a lot. But paper is just really hard to preserve, so if you write everything into a journal or something, it's basically just a ticking time bomb waiting for mildew and bookworms and environmental damage. The reason I suggest a blog instead of just saving some documents is because blogs are designed with sharing, searching, and media in mind, as well as being incredibly user-friendly on both ends. We talked about building your own archive of files, but going online is the way that you can share everything and the way to hook your audience. If you have a lot of web and graphic design skills, you could build a whole website that showcases your information beautifully and seamlessly. And if you have a computer and no idea what you're doing, you can get started with a blog in about 20 minutes and make something that looks really nice and that you can send to anybody online with no hassle at all. The next obvious question is, how do I start a blog? If you are that person I described with a computer and no idea what you're doing, this section is to help you navigate the creation of a blog on WordPress. You may be asking, why do you suggest WordPress? Well, I do want to say there are a lot of blogging platforms out there that you can use to create a blog, and you should look around and choose what you like, but there are also a lot of reasons that I like WordPress. It's really reliable. It was first developed in 2003, and it has outlasted a lot of other platforms. LiveJournal came first, but it saw that platform rise and fall. Same for Tumblr and Zanga and tons of other platforms that just didn't have the staying power of WordPress. There's a lot of documentation on how to use WordPress because a lot of people use it. If you're ever lost, someone will have the answer you need. At least in part, that's because it's an open source program that a lot of people use to manage larger websites. The back end of the library's website is WordPress. 
you can do a lot with it. The program is, is free, provided you can navigate their startup links, or you can pay for more features. You can build an entire fully hosted website with WordPress on any web host. So I'm going to walk you through making a free WordPress account. At wordpress.com, you can click get started in the top right hand corner, and you can sign in with an email address, username and password, or directly with your Google or Apple account. And now I need to pause because I am annoyed. WordPress has added a little bit of a runaround since the last time I made a blog. The thing that they're using are called dark patterns, and you see these online all the time. The term is fairly new. It was coined in 2010, and it's the terminology that we use for any time a website or an app has been crafted to trick users into doing something that they don't actually want to do, usually by showing a big bright button that says buy now or something, and then a tiny little link for the free option. The most common example is probably how every time you make a purchase on Amazon, it gives you a big button that says sign up for Amazon Prime and save 20% and then a little link under it that says no, I don't want to save 20% that you have to click if you want to continue without signing up for the service. It's a tactic that's very prevalent in mobile games as well. Uh, there are, you can usually play a mobile game for free as much as you want, but there are lots of buttons that try and trick you into buying extra things. <sighs> anyway, this is a tangent, but I just, I really want to stress that this is a free platform and it's easy to use. And all you need to do is never agree to pay for anything while you're setting it up. Once you do get set up, there won't be any more pitfalls. So after you have built your basic account, they are going to ask you to choose a domain for your blog. A domain is the word for the main part of your site's web address. So the library site is situatelibrary.org. The domain is Situate Library. Uh, so you can set it to be whatever you want, as long as it hasn't been taken already. Um, and as you try different options, WordPress will make some suggestions to you. You can see here that I went with theronfamilytree.wordpress.com and there are those dark pattern links. They make it really easy for you to buy a domain free for the first year, but what you want to do is scroll a little further and choose yourname.wordpress.com and you can see that one is free with no qualifiers. Once you have chosen a domain, it'll take you to your dashboard. And that is your website's behind the scenes area and the way that you manage everything about how it looks and all the content. This is why I like WordPress. Right here, it gives you a tutorial on how to set up every piece of your site, starting with a name and the way your homepage and menus look. Then you can get the app on your mobile device if you want, and then you can launch so that the public can see it. You can create as much or as little content as you want before launching. The place that your site actually lives, where all of your content will be, is the posts tab in the navigation bar. And they provide an example post with a lot of content ideas right in it. So if you click that, it takes you to the post editor where they have another little tutorial that shows you how to use it. Once you have however many posts you want to get started with, and you finish the other steps that you want to complete in the tutorial, you can go to the launch button. It's going to make you repeat that little dark pattern, click skip purchase to keep what you decided on earlier. Can you tell that I'm upset about this? I get so mad about this kind of thing. <laughs> I know that WordPress has to pay the bills, but this is predatory. So anyway, after you skip that payment, it directs you to choose a plan with various levels, encouraging you to choose their premium plan. And you should ignore all that. It's free. Don't choose a plan. Click the link that says start with a free site. And then you're done. You have a blog that you can update with family stories whenever you want to. That's searchable by yourself and others. It'll show up in web results when people search for the ancestors that you're writing about. And you can find the site that I made at theronfamilytree.wordpress.com. Um, it's up there pretty much forever, even though there's nothing on it. Uh, I will, <laughs> will not be using it, but I put a little beginning of a story about the imaginary watermelon spitting incident um, on there, just like as an example of what a blog post looks like. If you want to learn more, 
this is the end of the series. Uh, but there are three total videos um, on this topic of genealogy and telling your family's tale. Uh, if you have any questions about anything we've discussed, there is one more Q&A session on July 27th at 6 p.m. And otherwise, if you have any questions or want any assistance in your research, you can get in touch with me at the library or email me directly at katherine at situatelibrary.org. Thank you so much for watching this series. It was a lot of fun to put together, and I hope it was useful.